Today, I'm going to discuss with you a most interesting presentation of a Desmet's detachment. This 65-year-old patient underwent phacoemulsification surgery for his left eye two years ago. The surgery was uneventful and following surgery, he attained a vision of 6 by 6. He remained well for almost two years. He presented to us two years later with a three-month history of diminution of vision. On examination, this is what we found. His vision had dropped to counting fingers at one meter and he presented with a significantly large central corneal opacification. On performing an ASOCT, this is what we found. In an area corresponding to the corneal opacification, there was a Desmet's detachment. It's to be noted that when we examined the other eye, the cornea in the other eye was completely normal. We decided to perform a desmetopexy and the patient was prepared for the same. So this really was a very unusual presentation of a spontaneous desmet detachment two years after the primary surgery. Let's now proceed to the desmetopexy that was done for this patient. So I like to perform the desmetopexy under a peribulbar block. The reason for this is the fact that most often we are doing a desmetopexy for a recently operated eye and these eyes can be sensitive and you want pain relief as well as control during this procedure. Moreover, you're going to inject some intracameral air or gas which increases the pressure within the globe and that itself can cause significant amount of ocular discomfort. And hence, I always opt for a peribulbar block for my desmetopexy procedures. The next thing to be considered is which is the gas that is going to be used. We have two options. One could be intracameral air which is what I usually use and works really well. The other option which I may use sometimes in a difficult case or in a re-detachment following a primary air injection could be a 14% isoexpansile C3F8 gas. Preoperatively, the only thing I start is a topical antibiotic drop a day or two before surgery. If it is an immediate post-operative case, the patient is anyway going to have been on his post-operative steroid antibiotic drops, so nothing else needs to be added here. Counseling these patients comes with a challenge of its own. These patients are rather dissatisfied because they have an end result which actually equates to a loss in their vision. Thus, we need to have an extensive counseling procedure where we try and regain the faith of the patient, make them understand what has gone wrong, what is the surgical procedure that you're trying to do, what is it that you're trying to achieve by this surgical procedure, and the possibility of requiring perhaps even more than one air injection to settle the desmet strip. Let's now move to watching the desmetopexy that we performed for this patient. So here's the patient with a rather dense corneal opacification from a long-standing desmet detachment. At the outset, I think it's extremely important to remove the corneal epithelium. What this actually does is gives you such good visibility during the desmetopexy procedure. Now, in order to perform a desmetopexy, I take a 30 gauge needle and as you can see, it is just proximally bent at the hub. I ensure that if I have to have more than one injection at a time, I change the needles because they do get blunt on repeated injections. This needle is then connected to a tubercle and syringe into which we draw the gas that we want to inject into the patient's eye. The globe is stabilized with the help of a fine-toothed forceps and the 30 gauge needle now traverses to a certain distance which is almost a few millimeters within the cornea and then dips inwards after which the gas or the air is injected. Upon completion of the air injection, please note how the needle works its way back through the track initially created resulting in a well sealed port of entry.
What you look for after this is that as the air of the gas ends up settling the decimates, the cornea starts to clear. This is what we are trying to visualize in this part of the video. Please note that to be able to actually visualize the clearing of the cornea can take up to a few minutes. At the end of a few minutes, we did end up losing a little bit of air from the anterior chamber, however, we were able to achieve some amount of clearing of the cornea. Since at this sitting itself I needed to perform a second injection, I chose now to use 14% C3F8. Let's see how that is made. Now this is the C3F8 gas which is used by our vitreoretinal consultants. And here's how you prepare the 14% C3F8. The C3F8 is drawn out up to the 0.14 mm mark, which is demonstrated here. And the rest of the syringe up to the 1 mm mark is filled with air. This gives you the correct concentration. We now proceed to the intracranial injection of this 14% C3F8 gas from another side. It's important not to re-inject from the initial port of entry because the second injection at the same site prevents that entry wound from remaining self-sealing and therefore you have a tendency to then lose gas. Note how where the venting incisions were made, fluid starts to come out. We've got a nice tight air fill which, which enables the fluid to come out through these venting incisions. This step of letting the fluid come out of the venting incisions often takes a couple of minutes. You need to continue doing this till no more fluid comes out from the venting incisions. That is the time you know that all the fluid is probably drained out. 
As you would have noticed, I still have my needle within the anterior chamber and as the fluid keeps coming out, I keep intermittently injecting a little more fluid to encourage the fluid to come out even more. Now, once there is no more fluid coming out of the venting incisions, now note how I use McPherson's and just press it against the venting incisions. If there were to be still some residual fluid, it would come out using this maneuver. At the end of the desmetopexy procedure, you would ideally want to see a completely clear cornea. But as you can see here, even though some part of the cornea seems to have cleared, there still are a lot of corneal folds clearly visible. I now attempt to try and flatten out these folds. In order to do so, I make a paracentesis incision superiorly. The paracentesis incision is made with great care and caution, ensuring that I do not lose any gas from within the anterior chamber whilst doing so. A 30 gauge needle is bent in a manner demonstrated here in order to achieve the same. Please note how I introduce that bent tip into the eye and I pull in the folds with an attempt to flattening them. And as you can see, I'm unable to achieve a flattening of the folds. And finally at the end of the surgery, this is what our patient's cornea looks like. The eye is then patched with an antibiotic ointment to promote reepithelization and one drop of homide to prevent a postoperative pupillary block. Now here's how we manage the patients in the postoperative period. One, few hours after surgery, especially if you've got a complete air fill, we take the patients up onto a slit lamp and just burp the eye. That is, on the slit lamp, under a topical anesthetic, a 30 gauge needle is passed into the eye at the limbus and a little amount of air is let out. This is the burping procedure. This prevents the chances of a postoperative pupillary block. And these are the postoperative OCT images. The desmus membrane seems to have flattened significantly. Do however note the presence of those fibrous folds which still exist. This is what the cornea looked like four hours after the surgery. Following the burping of this patient to reduce the quantum of the air in the anterior chamber, this is what the cornea looked like and you can notice that the central part of the cornea seems to have cleared quite a bit. However, in the area of the folds, there still is a significant corneal haze. This is what the patient looked like two days after the surgery. In all probability, looking at this appearance, that is, the residual corneal haze and a significant amount of desmids fibrosis, this patient is going to require an endothelial keratoplasty. The clinical presentation of these late onset desmids detachments are those of a chronic corneal edema, corneal decompensation, and sometimes a corneal opacification. Conventional methods of intracambral air injection may or may not work in these cases. Clearly, as you can see in this particular case, the presence of supradesmids fluid is going to make the reattachment with an intracambral air injection often difficult, challenging and impossible. Therefore, the need to create these venting incisions to allow for the ease of drainage of this fluid, which is then followed by a pneumatic desmetopexy, is likely to allow for the successful reapposition of this detached desmids membrane. With this, I come to the end of this presentation. Thank you.